Okay, we are continuing our discussion on legal firearm ownership and the process behind that and all the ins and outs with regards to what is legal and what isn't legal in South Africa. Um, with us again, we have Max Rosley from uh, Motivus uh, giving us some quality info here. Um, before we kick off, just remember our disclaimer, as we've said previously, that this isn't legal advice per se. And um, we sort of ask you, or I don't want to say challenge you, <laughs> but we ask you to test whatever we discuss here uh, against legal opinion um, so that, you know, that you'd rather stay safe and stay sound on the outside. So, Max, Based welcome. Thank, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you once again, Max. Um, right, last time we, we you know, had a... Had a go at um, the competency side and, and what a competency is and how to get your competency. And now we continue with the process. But first, before we get there, I think there's a, there's a lot of legal advice floating around, you know, um, on wherever, on, on social media, um, in person, and so on. What is your view on taking advice from lay people? Yeah, it's it's always a very difficult one. I, I think even taking broad stroke advice from legal professionals over social media and podcasts or shorts or reels or whatever people refer to them uh, uh, as these days, um, you know, short videos, etc. It's a very condensed um, to the point type of information delivery. And I think that kind of information delivery um, doesn't include all of the but ifs and caveats. Um, that the law is uh, fraught with. And um, I think before, or, or as with anything, when you when you take advice, have that advice tested, or when you take or when you take information in off of social media, or if you take information in off of uh, uh, platforms, or even, um, you know, uh, gun site, what do you call that? Uh, uh, it's not a blog, but it's... Uh, Forum, forum. forum, yes, that's correct. Yeah. So even taking advice off of forums, have it tested uh, with your friendly firearm attorney, somebody that has a, a legal degree and that can test the legislation or, or consider the interpretation of the act or, you know, um, the common law, whichever it may be. Um, but always sound it off of a qualified attorney and uh, always get the insight of the qualified attorney. Um, also, you, you can't... Nothing is ever uh, X, Y, Z, unless it's a statutory question, you know, um, under which section may I license this type of firearm? That's a that's a cut and dry thing. Again, um, I'd rather I'd rather get that information from a from a legal person or somebody with a, a, a deep intrinsic knowledge of the law, specifically the Firearms Control Act and its regulations. Um, but the same now, when may I use a firearm in self-defense? Uh, which I think we will be dealing with quite uh, intensively next on the next episode. Um, that's not something that you condense into a little short or into a, a brief little discussion. Um, it's also dealt with quite briefly in the competency material. Um, you know, it 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 doesn't go into the depths of it. So I think the next session is going to be very valuable in as far as that question is concerned. But again, any anything that's you know uttered or or discussed on um, social media or even on you know card, it doesn't matter what the source of information is. Uh, it should be tested and it should be uh, you know tested against the knowledge of a qualified expert within the firearms field. So whilst I consider myself. Uh, an expert in Firearms uh, Control Act and its regulations or firearms legislation in South Africa, um, I always welcome criticism and I always welcome, um, you know, a, a, a counter views or uh, different interpretations or uh, different models or testing models. And um, I think that's conducive to well-rounded knowledge. Um, there's, you know, this is certainly not a space where ego uh, should be... Um, objectified. Um, I think that uh, all legal practitioners within the firearms sphere um, should certainly uh, work on and guide one another um, in their views or in their opinions. And um, essentially that that offers the lawful firearm, firearm owning community good rounded off, um, you know, quality information 
um, in their decision making, and that's what we aim to achieve with these types of series. Or, or you know, it's it's all about. Um, I think subject matter experts is the right terminology, and I, I think we share that view. That uh, I think Fort, the Fortis model has always embraced the view that a subject matter expert per field is where the nuclear focus should be, and not trying to be a jack of all trades. Um, you know, within that sphere, I think that we specialize in you know in every um, in every sphere or qualification. There's specialists within a certain you know sector. Yeah. Um... <laughs> People often refer to the law. The law says this and the law says that. That's also one of these broad spectrum statements, you know. Uh, what What is the law? The law. So the law is what, when Sorrell says around the fire at 11 o'clock at night with his 11th double brandy down the chute. No, yeah. um, it's, it's always a... It's always a, a very tricky thing to try and define concisely. And I think um, the law, in as far as firearms are concerned and the fire, you know, uh, firearm sector, or, or rather, we, we draw in aspects of both the common law and then statutory laws. So the Firearms Control Act, um, its regulations, and uh, I think it's important to distinguish between the two briefly or as briefly as possible. And uh, I actually wrote down a very concise little definition of the common law. Um, and I think it's a, it's a more academic exercise, but it'll help explain to people. So um, the offenses of, let me rather define the common law first. The common law in South Africa are legal principles inherited from our English, Dutch, and Roman law. So we have a Roman-Dutch legal system, but we also have an English law influence um, in South Africa. It's quite a unique or sui generis um, common law system because of all the different influences, you know, um, and the different settlers or uh, different settler histories. And um, these, these different models have influenced the development uh, of the common law in South Africa very differently. So all legislation stems from common law principles initially. Um, it's right to do this and it's wrong to do that. And um, typically once something is codified, so written or recorded, it becomes statute. So the Firearms Control Act is a codified model of the right model on firearm ownership or law for firearm ownership which would have been common law before, you know, so uh, um, use or uh, possessing a firearm without a license wouldn't have been an offense until it was uh, stipulated that you must have a license or, you know, that there must be control over the object. So, for instance, um, murder is a common law offense. There is no statute, there is no legislation that says um, if the um, so if you uh, cause the death of another person uh, unlawfully so it's the unlawful causing of death of another human being is the definition of murder okay um not the unlawful killing or not the unlawful shooting or not the un it's the unlawful causing of death of another human being and there are many constructs around that um and that's sorry the unlawful and intentional causing of death of another human being um the unlawful negligent causing um, of death of another human being would be culpable homicide. And if you if you take these two constructs, these have been developed uh, via case law over the centuries. And, uh, you know, essentially the model of what constitutes murder and the common law defenses to that, such as the lawful use of potentially lethal force. Um, you know, so, so murder and assault or... or Common assault, or what have you, or assault with grief, uh, uh, or assault with the intention to cause grievous bodily harm, as constructs have certain defences or common law defences, which have also, through time and development of law, um, and adoption through our courts, been ironed out into case law and law reports. And uh, these these are the binding principles that our courts today follow. So. Murder as a construct and the defences to you know against a charge of murder are common law, whereas an offence in terms of the Firearms Control Act would typically be doing something that you are not supposed to do in terms of the act. So you you commit an act which is prohibited in terms of the act, or 
failing to do something that is mandatory in terms of the act. So the act says you must do X, but you fail to do X. Those are the, the constructs of the statutory side of our law. So the, the law's um, origin or the or the source of our law is either the common law or you know statute. Uh, for instance, also, it tends to be its own, own sphere. So we'd have our common law and our statutory law or our statutes um, but then there's also the constitution, and the you know the constitution plays a role in as as our supreme law in South Africa um, in every aspect of law. So there's within the common law, constitutional principles are taken into account. Within statutory offences, even constitutional principles are taken into account. Um, these are this is how the law is integrated in South Africa. So um, I hope that gives a, a sort of a brief a brief insight into the distinction between our common law and legislation or, or statutory law i think for me it comes down to this that if somebody tells you what the law says then don't take that as legal advice <laughs> right so max we've discussed the competency side of it getting your competency um, going through the process with the police um, now obviously a person gets a competency with the aim of buying a firearm at the end of the day well, I think before we continue with the process at the end of the day, it's, it's good to understand what is a firearm and what isn't a firearm. You know, what is prohibited, what is restricted. So if you can expand on that, what is a firearm, what isn't a firearm? Excellent. Um, yeah, let's start with that. I think that's a good place. I think a lot of, I think it's good to go back down to the core of it. And uh, I think that's great. Let's go to the definitions in the Firearms Control Act. Sorry, I'm going to read from the Act because I don't think anyone's, memorize the wording um, despite pretending to have done so. Um, I was just about to pretend that I did. <laughs> Excellent. So, Dion, let's start with the definition of a firearm in terms of the Firearms Control Act 60 of 2000. So another important thing, whenever dealing with the Firearms Control Act um, or interpreting the act or reading the act, always make sure to use the most recent version uh, I like to use the version published on the Nas um, National Hunting and Shooting Association or NATSHOOT or NHSA's website. Uh, it's updated and it includes all the academic updates or most of them uh, from what I've picked up over the years of using it. Uh, but it's a really up-to-date version. Don't use the outdated ones. There's a lot of stuff that's happened since the first, you know, the first publication in 2004 to now. Um, so first of all, Firearm means any device manufactured or designed to propel a bullet or projectile through a barrel or cylinder by means of burning propellant at a muzzle energy exceeding eight joules. So if it uses a propellant to propel a projectile through a barrel, whether it's rifled or not, it's a firearm. Um, any device manufactured or designed to do, discharge rimfire, sense fire or pin fire ammunition. So rimfire ammunition, uh, like the .22 LR cartridge, or center fire ammunition, like most center fire, where the primer sits in the middle uh, of the, the head of the case, uh, or pin fire ammunition, which is very unpopular these days. It's, it's a very antiquated style of ammunition. But those all constitute, um, any device manufactured to fire those types of ammunition is constitutes a firearm. Um, any device which is not, a, at the time, capable of discharging any bullet or projectile, but which can be readily altered to be a firearm within the meaning of paragraph A or B. It's very difficult to think of a very practical example right now, um, but it could be, say, for instance, um, a, a firearm which was not deactivated properly in accordance with the Act, or the deactivation um, was never registered, or the deactivation is uh, not in terms with... Uh, not on terms of proper protocol or deactivation protocol. Um, so, for instance, uh, the trigger was removed, um, you know, from an antiquated firearm. If if it can simply by inserting a, a trigger component uh, become a functional firearm again, it's it's difficult because that already complies with the firearm in terms of another section of the Act. Uh, yeah. But here it says specifically at the time not capable of discharging. So that that would be a practical example. Uh, then any device manufactured to discharge a bullet or any other projectile of a caliber of 5.6 mils, so 0.22 or higher, um, at a muzzle the energy of more than 8 joules by means of compressed gas. Okay, So any gas-driven uh, firearm with a caliber greater than 0.22 
so uh, a projectile great in diameter than 0.22 um, and that creates a muzzle energy of more than eight joules. Same, instead of propellant this time, it's by way of gas, okay? Um, so compressed gas. Then uh, also it means a barrel frame or receiver of a device referred to in paragraphs A, B, C. So basically the barrel frame or receiver of a firearm. Um, and these you'll notice are typically the, the serialized parts of firearms in South Africa. Typically slides um, on handguns aren't serialized, but the barrel will be serialized as well as the frame. And then receivers and barrels will typically be uh, serialized on uh, self-loading systems, you know, uh, whether they be uh, rifles, carbines, or shotguns. It'll typically have a serial number on the receiver or the barrel and all. And um, yeah, and it, very important, but does not include a muzzle-loading firearm or any device contemplated in Section 5. Um, so Section 5, we'll get there now, is devices specifically defined in the Act which are not firearms. Beyond what I'm going to do now, now that we've defined a firearm in terms of the Act, um, I'd like to go into... Um, we're going to jump to Section 5 of the Firearms Control Act 60 of 2000, which defines devices that are not firearms for purposes of the Firearms Control Act. So we've defined what firearms are, and for the purposes of this Act, the following devices are not regarded as firearms. A, any explosive-powered tool manufactured specifically for use in industrial applications, including line-throwing guns and impex type building pistols so what's interesting here is that seems to be almost a closed list um it doesn't yeah it, it's it's a difficult one and they they typically there aren't many other than line throwing guns and impex type build, uh, uh, building pistols but we'll move on from there uh, any explosive powered tool manufactured to split rock or concrete by means of discharging an explosive charge Okay, that, that's pretty typical um, within the demolition and obviously open cast mining and deep mining uh, um, ventures. Then any industrial tool manufactured for use in the mining and steel industry to remove refractory material. Any captive bolt gun manufactured for use in an abattoir in the humane killing of animals. A muzzle loading firearm. An air gun a tranquilizer firearm, a paintball gun, a flare gun, a deactivated firearm, and any other device which the minister may, by notice in Gazette, exempt. So note there, an air gun, tranquilizer gun, paintball gun, flare gun, deactivated firearm. Now, I think from here it's important to define ammunition. Ammunition means a primer or a complete cartridge. Now this takes us down the next rabbit hole. Now there are, I don't know if you'll remember, there was this very large influx at one stage of what they referred to as blank guns, number one, and then pepper guns, number two. So there was one that just made a, a banging sound and it cycled the, the handgun slide like it, uh, essentially a handgun would, it, it would offer the same, um, how can I say it, mechanical characteristics as a handgun going off, but it would just not discharge anything out of the barrel. The other one was a pepper cartridge, which also had a what seems to be a primer, you know, or, or some sort of explosive cap, which would fire pepper out of this the small 9 millimeter or 10 millimeter size cartridge, you know, um, with a case. So it would be a case with what appeared to be a primer in it. Now, the definition of a primer will be in the ordinary usage and, uh, you know, in the ordinary definition of a primer. Um, a primer is not really defined in the Act. A primer um, is ammunition in terms of our Act, and it, it was kind of a grey area. So a primer's definition... is a cap or cylinder containing a compound which responds to friction or an electrical impulse and ignites the charge in a cartridge or explosive. So if there is no charge or explosive uh, in the cartridge, 
to ignite, if the purpose is not to ignite anything, is that a primer? In the ordinary, you know, in the ordinary interpretation. It's a difficult one, it's a technical one, but again, um, it on on face value, it would seem that you're in con, you know, so so being in possession of a primer is an offense, irrespective of whether uh, it's intended for the ignition of uh, an explosive, you know, uh, content of a case. So it's it's a very difficult one, and you'd need a good attorney to get down to the in interpretation of that. If you were arrested for being in possession of a primer with this cap, with this blank gun, or or whatever they want to call it, um, there's another device which I, I had a fun legal opinion on a while back, um, where it's a device used for the training of gun dogs. So it fires a, a basically a foam dummy using what appears to be a primer. No, no propellant. No, you know, nothing other than a cap that ignites and that creates enough force to fire this dummy a couple of meters away, you know, uh, 50 meters or whatever you're away. Now, again, whether that constitutes ammunition, uh, the possession of that, that, that cap, the cap's not just there for percussion. It's not just there for creation of noise. That cap is there to create thrust or to, to propel something. So it, it's always a very, very difficult, uh, contentious interpretation that we need to be very cautious of. And, uh, that's why I say, if you're uncertain, get a legal opinion before buying or before committing to these things. Um, it can get you into a lot of trouble and it can cost you a lot of money to determine that, oh, okay, sorry, well, it wasn't that. You know, and uh, that that could be 100,000 Rand later or more or worse, you know, um, in legal fees because that that ramps up quickly. And the, the aggressiveness that firearm-related offenses are prosecuted, um, you know, within South Africa is quite scary and uh you don't want to find yourself on the on the receiving end of the dock for something as silly as a gray area primer position you know without a license so yeah that's that's very important and uh i think we've now defined ammunition as a cartridge a, a, a complete cartridge or um a primer now a complete cartridge is typically a case paired with explosive propellant, paired with a bullet, and paired with a primer. That you know that that combination together, a case on its own, a bullet on its own, you know the the actual projectile on its own, the the case on its the brass case on its own don't constitute ammunition. You may only be in possession of explosive propellant if you hold a license in terms of the act. Um, you may only be you may only be in possession of a primer if you hold a license in terms of the act. Essentially, um, ammunition and uh, uh, full cartridges. I think the second that you've paid, well, the second you're in possession of a primer, irrespective of whether it's uh, charged or not, you're in possession of a cartridge, uh, or or you're in possession of ammunition. Um, once the primer is being uh, shot and you put a bullet in an empty case with a dispensed primer, are you in possession of a cartridge? No, I think you require the balance of the components of a cartridge. A cartridge is defined as the combined uh, four elements, you know, primer, propellant, case, bullet. So again, technical, be cautious with that kind of thing. Um, you know, get advice or, or, you know, get proper paid advice and uh, be cautious with collecting ammunition that you don't have licenses for because that's an offense in terms of the act. And uh, yeah, it's it's always difficult. I know as, as children many years ago, you'd often go to a mate's house and there would be this massive, impressive, um, you know, collection of ammunition. A lot of the stuff would still be primed, you know, and then dad wouldn't have a license for that rifle or, you know, or often... After uh, some recreational shooting, there might be some .22 ammo still in a pocket, or some nine more rounds that you know potentially didn't go off, um, you know, in in somebody's pocket after joy shooting under your direct supervision. Everything's lawful. It gets in his car, drives off. Problem. Um, again, uh, possession of ammunition. So let's go to section three of the Act. It states it it deals with the general prohibition of possession of firearms or ammunition without licenses. 
Um, so section three of the act reads, as soon as my PC plays the game, no person may possess a firearm unless he or she holds for that firearm a license, permit or authorization issued in terms of this act or a license, permit, authorization or registration certificate contemplated in items one through to five of schedule one. So no person may possess a muzzle-loading firearm unless he or she has been issued with a relevant competency certificate. So that's a very important departure point for, for the next uh, part of our, our discussion. Yep. We've now dealt with firearms and we've dealt with devices that are not considered to, to be firearms and we've dealt with what constitutes ammunition. Before we depart on the different sections of licensing, i just like to deal with section four of the act, which is what constitutes a prohibited firearm. So we know what firearms are and what firearms we're allowed to license, but what firearms in terms of the act are we not allowed to license? Then we go into section four, which deals with prohibited firearms at states. The following firearms and devices are prohibited firearms and may not be possessed or licensed in terms of this act, except as provided for in section 17, 18, 19, and 20, okay? So that would be collectors typically, and um, that would be for uh, business purposes to a, to a degree or an extent. And uh, let's deal with the prohibited firearm list. Firstly, any fully automatic firearm. Again, the distinction between semi-automatic and fully automatic. Semi-automatic is that with the single depression of the trigger, only a single cartridge is discharged. Fully automatic means I depress the trigger and multiple uh, uh, cartridges are discharged from the magazine um, until I release the trigger. Um, and again, on the depression of the trigger, it will uh, uh, fire until I release the trigger or until the magazine runs dry. Uh, whereas again, semi-automatic firearm, every time I pull the trigger, the, the action will cycle, it will uh, self-load but it won't fire a subsequent shot until I release and reset the trigger and fire a subsequent shot. So any fully automatic firearm is a prohibited firearm. Any gun, cannon, recoilless gun, mortar, light mortar, or launcher manufactured to fire a rocket, grenade, self-propelled grenade, bomb, or explosive device. So typically anything for launching ordnance or any ordnance that's explosive. Um, apart from our primers, which don't constitute you know, we're, we're entitled in terms of the act to possess primers, but any gun, recoilless gun, mortar, so anything that fires a, a bomb or a bomblet or a mortar or a rocket or a grenade or any explosive ordnance. Any frame, body or barrel of such fully automatic firearm, gun, cannon or recoilless, so any frame, body or barrel of those items mentioned above. Any projectile or rocket manufactured to be discharged from a cannon, recoilless gun or mortar, or rocket launcher. Okay? Any imitation of any device contemplated above, excluding the frame, body, or barrel of a fully automatic firearm, or any firearm, the mechanism of which has been altered so as to enable the discharging of more than one shot with a single depression of the trigger. So that could be an over-the-counter semi-auto, uh, you know, a, rifle or carbine or shotgun, which has been altered mechanically to allow multiple shots to be discharged with a single depression of the trigger, um, or the caliber of which has been altered without the permission of the registrar. So uh, any caliber changes um, without permission under, the, so this is under, it must be done through a gunsmith and with permission from the registrar to alter that caliber. The barrel length of which has been altered without the written permission of the registrar. So cutting barrel shorter, that's a gunsmith's job and it must be approved by the registrar. And the serial number or any other identifying mark of which has been changed or removed without the written permission of the registrar. So removing any writing or removing any serial number from a firearm or manipulating those numbers is also a prohibited firearm. Um, it states here as a caveat that the incidental alteration of the length of a barrel um, by a firearm in the ordinary course of a gunsmith's work. So potentially attending to a headspace issue or threading or fixing uh, a, a threading issue, uh, which does not has, 
have as an objective the alteration of the length of the barrel of that firearm must not be regarded as an alteration contemplated in this section. So I've given you some practical aspects where they have to deal with headspace. Um, sometimes they have to cut the threading that goes into the receiver or into the, the action itself, um, which shortens objectively the barrel. Or potentially if there's a threading error when they were putting a suppressor on the rifle, they have to cut that threading off and re-thread. The aim is not to shorten, the aim is to fix the threading mistake. Um, so I, I hope that um, gives you some practical indication as to what prohibited firearms are in terms of the act. It's always a good idea to read uh, sections three through to five and to consider what's in your possession, what's in the safe, what's lying around the house. There's a lot of ordinance or, or ex-ordinance, um, you know, decommissioned mortars, cannon shells, stuff like that. Read the act, get an opinion. Um, it's it's silly, but it might be a completely unrelated thing that SAP stumble across this stuff and the next minute you're the subject of a wonderful newspaper article and the registrar's gleaming smile. So that's, we've dealt with prohibited firearms, we've dealt with devices that are not firearms, we've dealt with firearms, we've dealt with ammunition, and we've dealt with everything that we may lawfully possess in terms of the act and may not lawfully possess in terms of the act. I think we can now start moving on to the actual licensing aspect.